So I'd like to thank everybody for coming to Christy Rinkland's Artist Talk. Uh, wanted to, you know, first of all, I want to make sure everybody here knows to ask questions, to interrupt when she runs across something Please. that you're interested in talking about. Um, we're going to probably cover both the, the kind of um, sequence that the paintings were made in, also some of the technical stuff, but I think the thing most of us are interested in is uh, the roots of the imagery, what you see in them, mm -hmm. and also I think that's where the audience comes in to kind of bring out the things that uh, that these the, the images emote for you or the observations you've made or what you thought uh, or you saw in these works, because I think the, the thing about them that's really interesting is the their ability to kind of conjure up microscopic, macroscopic, right. yeah, and a range of things. So anyway, um, welcome, Christy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, and I'd also like to thank James for giving this great opportunity. And this is a very special gallery, and just being here is wonderful on so many levels. Um, and many of those include just the interaction with the public as they come walking through and, and seeing me evolve this wall painting that I did in the front. Um, I, I think I'll start out by talking about just kind of three aspects of the work um, that are really centered in terms of what I think about when I make these. One is the history of painting is very important to me, like the idea of how pictorial space has really evolved through so many centuries in painting. It's depth, uh, perspectival space that implies infinity um, to going into this modernist sensibility of flatness, to going into this idea of extending out into the viewer's space. And now in contemporary painting, we have the ability to take all of those contradictory things and, and actually let them coexist. Um, the other thing that's very important to me with all of this work is, is actually the Baroque period is a, is a very important um, period that I refer to quite a bit. Um, as a contemporary artist, the Baroque is interesting in terms of its, um, its multimedia aspect in the way that a Baroque installation uh, is, starts to tie together two-dimensional, three-dimensional architecture, all those things coexist and how the decorative becomes this, this vehicle to, to take this, um, this idea and this sensibility and, and create this kind of dramatic sense of space. And so it's all about this idea of theatricality and this idea of drama, and it's a way to seduce the viewer and suck them into this otherworldly experience. And that's a very important part of my work as well. And as well. And the third thing is this uh, relationship with technology that I've been very interested in. And I've been using the computer as a tool to manipulate imagery and to source imagery for probably the past five or six years. I'm interested in, in it as a tool to be able to take an original image that I could co-op from many different sources and own it in some way. So for instance, I might scan an image from, um, a, from a Baroque painting, for like a background, a little detail, and I might render it through several different filters till it gets to a point where it looks nothing like the original, but it's something that I can use. But it also becomes a reference to our contemporary sense of seeing and imagining. So I feel really strongly that technology has started to inform even the way that we imagine space and the way that we imagine the psyche. Um, the idea that things kind of melt into like one from one form to the other, that color becomes synthetic rather than organic, that light has a certain kind of referential look and there's colors that are really associated with that. Um, I feel like our imagination has been altered by all of this. And so, you know, when we think of popular culture, we think of, you know, films, we think of just special effects in movies and all of these things that we just become so used to looking at, the way that the computer interface influences the way that we see, that this has become very, very ingrained in just the act of looking. And so all of these paintings encompass all of this. And, you know, it's a lot of stuff stacked up together. but. This is what's embedded in all of these works. Do you think it's important that the that you nail down a real like the source of those Baroque paintings, for the example you used, um, even if we can't see it in the end result, it, for you as opposed to creating something that looks for Baroque, for that to be an actual reference point, is that hmm. the reality of? You know, I don't know if I necessarily try to force that into the work, but I think it comes out naturally, you know, looking at a lot of the, a lot of that work. What I become very interested in with Baroque painting is there are two things. One is the compositional element and the other is the architectural decor element. And so, like this painting, for example, there are elements of this painting that are taken from a Tiepolo um, fresco painting. And some of it has to do with these swirling masses of clouds and this, this really dramatic compositional movement. 
And one of the things that really attracts me to those paintings, um, I actually just did a residency in Rome a few months ago, and you know the ceiling murals were really influential to me, and the fact that you could look up and there were these, these just very dramatic compositions that would kind of suck you into a space that felt like it was kind of moving up into infinity. And the image of the cloud is also a very key element with a lot of these paintings because it becomes this sort of organic passage that takes you from one realm to another. So it's like a way to bring you from the natural world to the supernatural world. And these paintings don't have specific religious um, implications at all. They, they have, it's more to do with the kind of psychological idea um, or, this, or, this, or the supernatural idea of like moving from physical space that you can exist in to a space that, that is maybe either more psychological or some kind of removed from reality. So, you know, so these cloud images that kind of swirl around um, become very symbolic for that, but they're also this, this compositional movement idea that happens in these paintings. So there's this, there's this kind of centered composition that comes from that painting that's inserted here, and so some of these paintings directly borrow, and then some of them have things that are maybe a little bit more um, kind of embedded so that you can't recognize them. Like this has an architectural element that's started to become embedded in the painting, but it doesn't necessarily resemble a specific piece. So some pieces are, you know, an art historian might be able to say, okay, I can recognize Tiffler there, but in other paintings they might not be able to. So, okay. And just in terms of chronology, all of this work has come from the last, for the most part, the last two years. Um, these three paintings in the front and this painting that's on the other side of the wall were a series of four paintings that were done um, right around the same time period. They're really about this idea of kind of an epic and dramatic space. Now, conversely to that, the paintings that are in the front wall are more portrait-like, they're more sort of um, articulated characters, and a lot of those come from sort of the organic elements that exist within the paintings. And so after developing these paintings that have these organic elements in them, I just wanted to actually play out characters and actually realize them as these individual little portraits. And I've been working with the oval format for quite a while, so the desire was to create this series of cameo paintings where they became little self-realized characters. Um, a lot of those are based on organic forms that come from jellyfish dissection and sea creatures, which I've been looking, to, looking at a lot as well. Um, a lot of those have this sort of psychological implication where they're very beautiful, they're very seductive. You want to reach out and touch them, but you're not quite sure if they're going to kill you or not. And so they have that seduction repulsion factor that's going on. Um, some of that's happening in these pieces right here, but um, maybe we can even move to the front, front wall and talk about those for a little bit, and then I can talk about the wall painting. Does the painting on the on the wall is that part of your adding that supernatural layer or another step to the environment that they're in? It would, it's, I would say it's very much part of the environment, and where that comes from is really thinking about the idea about how paintings function in space in a very baroque sense. Um, about four years ago, I was in a three-person show at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, and the other two painters that I was in the show with, um, we started to have a dialogue about how we wanted to present the space, and that we wanted to create this, we had this very large um, kind of cube-like space, but we wanted to think about this idea that the viewer would come in and experience this um, almost progression of, of, of dramatic experiences. So you could walk in and you would have like a climax on one end where you might have like a very large painting that would almost exist like an altarpiece and then you'd have a series of paintings that would flank the walls that would become almost like a narrative. And we were thinking very much about the way that paintings function in that Baroque space, that they're, they're very linked with the architecture rather than being autonomous and isolated. And I had recently just started to do this oval format and playing with the idea of, you know, what happens when you take a painting and you put it into an oval rather than a rectangle. What is that reference? Um, it's very much about the idea of, of frescoes and, and wall paintings and also cameos and things that are typically surrounded by some kind of de decorative element that links it to the wall. So the wall paintings were born out of that. They were born out of an idea to take the painting 
and link it to the architecture in some way. And typically in Baroque fresco painting, you will have this gilded sculpted frame that comes out of the wall. Sometimes there are elements of the painting that actually yeah. become sculpted and start to creep out of the painting itself. Like sometimes you'll have a leg and you'll have this relief piece and so the painting and the wall become almost like this blurred, blurred reality. Um, so with what I wanted to do is reduce that because I still am a contemporary painter. I'm not a Baroque painter. I, I still am coming out of um, a whole history of uh, of minimalism and modernism, and although I am very much into this idea of, of embellishment, I still have this reductive history that I come out of as well. So I wanted to reduce that and turn it just into a shadow. So, um, so the wall paintings have a decorative reference, but they also come from imagery that is connected with the painting. So, so they're meant to have this architectural feel, but they're also meant to feel like there might be something that crawls out of the painting as well, and there's this link between them. Um, and so I was able to do that in this front wall and in the back wall with a large oval. I also included a, a large um, wall painting with that. So, so anyway, there's about seven paintings in this series, and, you know, again, they were, the idea was to just create a series of, of little cameo paintings of these, like, beautiful little created monsters. And I started really thinking about the idea of, um, of how we envision monsters and how we imagine monsters and how um, like sea monsters, for example, come from this idea of something that actually exists in reality but then it's embellished. Like there's always a link or there's always some aspect of that image that's connected with something that we've seen or something that we've observed yet it's enhanced in some way. And you know, I'm very curious about, the, about why we do that. Like why, we, why do we romanticize something that is also terrifying? And that's you know, a lot of what, what these start to become is they become like this, this way to somehow or another allow you know, the seductiveness of something that might potentially be horrifying be elaborated on. When you're making, does there a little battle with when they become too beautiful that you have to add tentacles, or is there? Do you catch yourself halfway through of a, a, a one of these creatures going, "Oh my gosh, it's not dangerous enough, or it's too dangerous looking," and because they seem to be kind of balanced with that repulsion attraction. Uh -huh. And I was wondering if sometimes you go, well, I wasn't going to put these suckers on this one, or... Well, I, it's funny. I think, with, I think so far I have allowed myself to indulge myself as much as I, as I want. And, you know, I haven't been self-conscious about, about adding something that might kind of uglify it a little bit. <laughs> but, um... So you, you know yeah, what they so, look like? So, so, far, so far at this point, you know, these are really the product of me just allowing allowing that to just play itself out without much censoring. But I'm sure that if I were to make twenty more of these they they, they could get to the point where, where they might become, you know, like maybe too self indulgent. And that's always the fear. I think that's always the fear with my work is that for me, um, I'm very much into the idea that paint is this very seductive material. It's something that has a surface, it's something that has a depth. Um, there are dynamics that happen on that surface that you could never see in a reproduction. And engaging with that is very important to my work. The, the dangerous side of that is, is letting yourself become su too seduced by that. You know, as a painter, where do you step back and, and hold yourself back from actually giving to all of your indulgences? Um, and, and I'm not sure if I really know where that line is. <laughs> I have to trust myself that, it, that, I, that I know where it is. But, you know, again, I think that that that's that's what every artist experiences is when do you get to the point where you become so involved in your own work that you really you know you really can't see where you've gone with it. So. Well, it's curious. I mean, they all you, there's a sense of confidence in both the scale and the uh, intensity of these. So it doesn't definitely doesn't feel like you're adding something or subtracting something mm -hmm. for any reason other than compositionally or thematically. But I was just so. I guess the another way of asking the question is, have you found these creatures somewhere and drawn them and before you painted them? How much of it, how much development happens with them? How many legs yeah. do they have when you start? How many legs right, do they have when right. you end? That's a good question. Um, actually, I do a lot of work in my sketchbook. And I also have images that evolve from previous paintings. So if you were to look around in this show, 
you would start to see elements of some of these paintings that might actually be part of another painting in the show. So for instance, um, this painting right here is a result of, actually it's an interesting relationship. This painting was an image that I worked on the computer, the background, I was very interested in trying to develop that. I tried it here. Um, I wasn't convinced by this kind of double hole thing that was going on, so I made it into a single eye. Um, but I was still wanting to go back to it, so then I went to this to the computer piece. It's on the other side, the digital print that, that it has the painting on top of it. Was able to resolve it to a certain point, so I knew what would happen here. So the work is always in dialogue with itself. So there might be times where I might attempt something and I might fail, and then I have to resolve it in another piece. I have a piece. There is this actually one of these that's unstretched. It's stuck on my studio wall because it never worked out. So. Um, so there's always this information is always feed, is always feeding itself. Um, I also work a lot in my sketchbook where I might have part of an image that I might print out and I might draw on it and, and paint on it and then I might work on the painting and then I might draw from the painting and then photograph the painting digitally, print that out, work on it some more. So there's just a constant working that happens. I think so. that's really interesting. When you earlier when you were describing what broke was, mm -hmm. I was thinking that you and then you defensively kind of said, but I'm a contemporary artist. It seems yeah. like we're in a period that's really embracing all of this cross media pollination. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems like that very activity that you go through when you're not afraid to talk about using a computer or a projection right. or because there's all of the labor and this, you know, there's this traditional way of painting is updated by color and by subject right. matter. But then there's, you know, that seems to me like a, a, a very contemporary mindset that just if you call it Baroque seems old fashioned, but it seems like we're very, we're in a kind of a Baroque time as far yeah. as art goes. I mean, there's your right. wallpaper with mylar, and, and that was in the, both the Whitney and the show you were visiting tonight. And yeah. kind of, there's no limit. Basically, right. the more the better. There's, there's people doing rugs and chairs and walls and ceilings and right. whole environments and, you know, architecturally. So it, it feels very contemporary, and I think that it's it's interesting that you've, you know, that you've also kind of wrap it up in something that, um, you know, the the antecedents for both the, the kind of creatures and the mm -hmm. architecture and this other period and your direct experience with it mm -hmm. is that part of it is that to me gives it the solidity I think right. somehow where where the rest of it is is so fantastic that you I think it really helps somehow subconsciously that. There are these kind of this footing that it has because of the source material. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the other thing too is you're, is you're talking about that. One of the things I'm also thinking is um, that, that painting always is painting. You know, that no matter how much painting is affected by new media and technology, which it has to be. I mean, painting has to answer to that. It has to respond to that. It's a medium that's thousands of years old. It's got this huge tradition, and you know, as a contemporary artist. To, to paint is not all, it's always a questionable activity because there's so many other options you have. Um, yet at the same time, I think it's important to respond to new media. It's important to think about how that affects our worldview. I think it's important to think about how that affects the way that we, that we envision reality or even the imagination. But at the same time, there's processes of painting that will always remain the same. There's always going to be this process of of change and incorporating drawing and, and playing out variable and I when it, I become very interested in, in painters who use technological processes to play out traditional painting problems. For instance, Sigrid Sandstrom, my friend Sigrid Sandstrom, who used um, Photoshop as a means to play out an endless variable to a painting that she considered failed. You know, that's the classic right. problem, the failed painting that you can never end. You know, you could paint on it forever and when does it end? So she used technology as a way to play out all those variables. And so I've become very interested in, in how, how things, as much as things change, they always stay the same. I was wondering, Christy, if you use sort of chance or accident or how you use it in your paintings because you're so, the surface is so controlled, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, the, and the, the kind of quality is so, right. so controlled, the form is so controlled, but then every once in a while I do see these drips 
And I'm wondering, like, mm -hmm. was it really a drip, or was right, it like right, a right. controlled drip? Yeah, it, there are a lot of controlled drips, and mm -hmm. I, in a lot of ways, that's also playing to the language of painting and mm -hmm. the history of painting, and the fact that you have something that's an illusionistic material that that can transform itself into something that feels very fleshy material, but it's also a liquid material. It's a liquid medium. But in terms of variable and accident, the crazy thing is that as, as refined as these painting surfaces mm -hmm. seem to be, um, I could show you, for many of them, um, a record of the changes that happen, and some of them are, are maybe five or six different paintings underneath mm -hmm. before they finally become resolved. Um, and, you know, I think this becomes the classic struggle of which direction do you go to, go in, go in, which variable do you actually go with, um, and as much as using digital photography or digital imagery or using a scanner or picking things out helps me to arrive at an image, it also doesn't really take out the labor of the painting. So there might be um, within, not so much these small ones, but within the larger ones, I'll, I'll start something, paint the whole entire surface, and then realize, okay, this isn't right, this isn't going to work, and then I'll have to repaint the whole entire thing. Um, the painting that's, you know, like right or directly across from us that I was referring to earlier, that was a completely different painting, and then I had to, it just didn't work, didn't work out, and I had to sand it all down the star all over again. So, um, in some ways, the accident doesn't play into my work in the way that action painting would, um, but. I do also feel like there's a richness and a history that's invisible within the painting mm -hmm. that does come out, and, and sometimes I feel like if a painting becomes too easy, I, I almost feel like it feels too pat, like mm -hmm. it, that there's something about that tension, that struggle that happens regardless of what that final surface looks like that seems to add this, you know, whether it's all in my mind or not, it, it, it <laughs> adds a, a very different kind of, of resolve to the painting than if it's just kind of arrived to by going from A to Z. So it becomes a very non-linear process in that way as well. You talked a little bit about that different approaches to getting, since you're talking a little bit technically mm -hmm. about the, the application of pain and the historical references, the blurred or out of focus background mm -hmm. and, and to kind of build on what you were saying about the cloud earlier. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these, that when we even talked about you trying airbrush at the very end of the right. series in one of them to, right. to see about that. And that to me seemed like this direct comparison of like technology to what happens like you know three hours versus three days of, mm -hmm. of mixing and blending and um, you know and in addition to that the the look of that type of painting when it right. went. Right. And I you know I just didn't I thought in some of these there were pretty good examples of, of different approaches to it. Um, very, I mean, I think some of them, you know, you probably have an image that, that you've kind of disguised by mm -hmm. blurring it out. Um, right. But to me, it just, it, you know, formally there's that dropping back, pushing forward thing that the push and pull that you do in, you know, several ways. That's one of the ways. The other ways, like architecturally, they have things that are coming toward us mm -hmm. and that, you know, you know are three-dimensional, be painted. And um, just was curious if, you know how these things evolve. If you if you start off with that ground and then mm -hmm. land something in it, mm -hmm. or if you're coming back in to it afterwards, or mm -hmm. yeah. You know. Well, with these, with these are in in some ways these particular little paintings are are a bit more linear than the larger paintings um, because there really is a set background that's painted in, and then there's this intermediate layer that's usually like this flat kind of almost graphic looking cloud that sets the, the object, the, the object is almost like a little place for this object to sit against and it pushes it forward and then there's this foreground image. So there's essentially three layers to these paintings. Um, some of them, a lot of them actually come from a scan detail of a particular painting. A lot of times the source doesn't matter. You know, I can tell you what painting it was, but it really doesn't really matter because the fact that it looks like that is not important to the final product. It's really just about kind of compositional movement that comes out of that. Um, that is scanned, blurred, um, <coughs> filtered in Photoshop, and then I print it out and then I work from that. And then the background is painted, but it becomes this kind of really kind of crazy contradiction because it's this digital process, but then it's painted in this very traditional 
manner, you know, so it's like oil on canvas. Or the filters you're, you're using named after painterly processes. Well, that's the funny thing, too. Is <laughs> I love that. that. When you go into Photoshop, you know, you have this whole, like, artistic blur or artistic filter, and it's all, like, you know, like the impressionistic filter or... They don't have... You know, the, the, the dry yeah, brush filter, it. and they're all... You know, and I think that's what's interesting about this whole idea of, you know, like I think about the rectangle, and the rectangle is so ubiquitous, and it's... You know, it's part of, it's like film and it's photography, but then I feel that always refers back to painting anyway. So, you know, the rectangle is really, we're, we're, we're calibrated to see that way because of painting. You know, I just feel that strongly about it. So there is this, this kind of strange relationship between high tech and, and, very, and you know, all, something that's, that's, that's like part of antiquity in a way. You know, like even painting oil on canvas is is very much part of a more traditional kind of media, whereas painting has moved into so many realms of synthetic media, and, and even going into areas where paint isn't even used, but it's still considered painting. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but but um, I think essentially there is this you know relationship that happens where there's a step that happens where there might be an initial source that is manipulated and then it's paint, painted from. Um, and then usually from there, what's painted on top of that is a response to that background in some way. So color decisions are made, you know, according to what's there. Um, sometimes there might have to be, I might have to actually go back and change a whole entire area in response to what happens in the foreground. So there's, they're always interrelated. Do you want to get around the corner to the, sure. the larger one? And, you know, the oval, the, you had mentioned the cameo, but I yeah. think it's like the portrait, the right. shape of the face. That, that always seems to be a, a real specific reference, too. Yeah. Maybe now I can finally get far enough back that yeah. I don't have to drive. Well, in a way, it's kind of fitting that we go from there to here, because this is actually the, the oldest painting that's in the show. It's about three years old. And um, this painting was done for the show that I, that I talked about earlier. Um, but when I did this painting, I remember I had, this was one of these last minute decisions where I had this big show coming up and I thought to myself, okay, I need to have one more thing and I have two months to finish it. And so I built this painting um, with the help of somebody that, you know, with the help of a friend of mine that helped me build the oval canvas. Um, and painted it in two months, and it was really a matter of trust, where you know you have a finite period of time to finish something, and you have to trust every decision you make. And when I completed this painting, I thought to myself, this painting is so dense and it's so packed that I could unpack this painting for several years and work off of it. In a lot of ways, the paintings that are on the front wall really do come from this. So this painting is probably one of the more densely saturated spaces. You'll notice in some of the other paintings, there's a lot more white space and open space. Like this one, for example, the space is much more simplified. Um, there's much more white playing in there. For me, white is very much about the emptiness of space in a painting. Like white signifies where the painting begins and there's nothing there yet. Um, and this painting is, is just packed with information. So there, the these kind of biological cellular forms that start to move within this space um, really become manifested as almost like little creatures in this painting over here. Um, and also, going back to the whole idea of, of the oval, I've always been very interested in the whole idea of a painting as this container. So you have this object, you know, a rectangle or an oval, and it contains space within it. And sometimes that space is a window where space continues on beyond it. Like you might have an actual picture where you might have a landscape and there's this, there's this idea that you capture just one piece of it. Other times it might be that everything in that painting is just contained within that space and it's like finite in a way. And so I thought to myself, okay, you know, what's the difference between putting space in a rectangular form format versus putting it in an oval format? What does that start to do? What does that imply? You know, that might imply the idea of peripheral vision and the fact that when we see things, you know, with our eyes, that it's actually more of an organic kind of shape, that things fuse out as we go out into our peripheral vision. The idea of a telescope or binoculars that we look through, and there's this kind of hazy thing that happens as we go out towards the edges, and it's almost containing more round form. 
Um, the other reference is also the idea of the looking glass, which has always been very interesting to me. Like I was this huge fan of Alice in Wonderland when I was a kid, and I used to always think, oh, wouldn't it be great to just kind of like crawl through a rabbit hole and be somewhere else, or crawl through a looking glass and be in this alternate universe. Which and, you're now successfully doing. <laughs> which is what all these things are essentially about, really. And, you know, and so again, um, the oval became really about that looking glass. Like, this is a portal. This is that looking glass. The other thing is, um, I mentioned Cameo before. Um, I remember talking to an art historian about oval format and asking him, you know, okay, what's the history of using this in paintings? And he said, well, um, it's a very common format of mirrors. And the reason why is because the oval is said to contain the human proportions in this ideal way. Which is also interesting for me because I used to be a figurative painter and then I became an abstract painter. So I have this figurative history within my work. And I feel like these paintings are very much about figuration. They're very much about a figure kind of a figure ground relationship. And so the idea that the oval format has linked to the figure is also you know, very fascinating to me. Um, and again, I've put wall paintings around the rectangular paintings before and I've been very happy with that. But I also feel like with the oval format, it seems to really um, be very significant and very specific because when you see oval paintings in art history, a lot of times they are embedded within an architectural space and they really are part of this idea of you know, being, uh, being this large cameo that's embedded within this kind of decor space. So the reference becomes even more significant. In the, the most recent two, um, two or three of the larger rectangle paintings, it seems that some of the biomorphic or biological forms have given way to some, a much more specific landscape shape. Yeah. And, and yeah. Can you, did you, I mean, is that nailed down because of interest in other work or because of that white space, in, in kind of investigating that white space of the empty canvas? Or? Yeah. Actually, it's interesting because um, it refers back to some some ideas that I started thinking about a few years back. Um, and I started thinking about the idea of how paintings are constructed, specifically Renaissance paintings, where you have this foreground image of, you know, let's say this, you know, usually this this kind of biblical scene. You know, it's like maybe you know the Madonna and the Christ and all this kind of stuff, and you've got this background. Painting and there's this crazy little landscape that's going on that has nothing to do with right. the foreground. And there's some little man and there's a ship and it's very anachronistic it's almost too, like somebody because, else painted it. You know, and, <laughs> and, and actually it's funny because in my whole relationship and knowledge of those paintings have completely changed. Like I, when I first looked at them, I was like, oh, this is so strange and psychological. And then as I learned more, I realized, oh, that's Rome. That's this what is, it looks like. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the Dolomites. That's, that's Italy yeah. back there in the background. This is supposed to be Bethlehem, uh, supposedly. And this person that's really small in there is the patron. So there's this interesting construction. But then I think when we look at these paintings without that knowledge, it becomes this very kind of surreal, almost um, contradictory kind of space. Like these things could never exist with each other. So I was really interested in those little background spaces. They're so idiosyncratic. They're so strange. You know, like w w what is that little path leading to? What is that strange little mountain doing in there? And so, um, so I started actually taking little portions of that and inserting them into earlier paintings. Um, and then this one, I kind of departed from that for a little while, but I wouldn't bring that back into this one. And actually, some of these paintings are from like Perugino and Leonardo paintings, where the, the, the landscape is just so articulated in this very um, like mannered way. Like it's, a, it's a landscape that could never, ever exist in reality. It's so heightened, um, but it makes it feel very, very strange and psychological. And so I took those images and I scanned them, I inverted their colors so they became almost like a negative, and they exist in almost these little thought bubbles that start to move in and out of the space. So it's this idea that the painting can also be a space that can be punctured, that, the, that there's multiple spaces that exist within here. We might see this as the surface, but then we can start to kind of move around and, and, and get sucked into the background, and that creates another kind of space, and then all of a sudden we start to look into this space and that contradicts what this is. And so we're, our perspective is always thrown off. You know, we're never comfortable within where we place ourselves in that space. But for me, I feel like that's the thing that painting can really do. Like painting can allow us to have all those contradictions coexist and have all the discomfort stay in one space. And, you know, and it only works within the flat paint, the flat 
surface of the painting. Like you could never simulate that in three dimensional space. No, you definitely. I mean, that that's such an interesting point because I think you catch yourself in these looking past something that's covering something up that you want to see more of, and mm -hmm. much in the way that you're looking at that lens, you. You've seen Cosimo de Medici, and you're looking at the background to see if that little town that you might recognize. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're, he's, they're kind of in the way that that top layer. You're trying to yeah, look past yeah, and, yeah. and it's sculpturally it, it, that operates in a completely different fashion. And I mean, this this one I think particularly has unexpected. What you think is the transparency is actually something else. And yeah. so when you start, uh, there's a lot going on in these that it really takes some digestion I, I know from kind of spending the last week with them that mm -hmm. even you know looking at the images is is one thing you can pick up on some things but the the direct experience and, and finding all of these moments in there and, and surprises when you you kind of think you read the painting and then there'll be a lot of other areas going on and then you'll start getting lost in kind of what areas glazed or mm -hmm. you know so they separate and hold together in really interesting ways I think and the you know, the, just the shift, the kind of a more architectural, I guess it would be, feeling or landscape in this one or in the one on the other side, the um, Cinerama, mm -hmm. is, you know, has a different kind of architectural, like really right. strong frame inside the frame. Yeah. Um, and you, the, the thought bubble versus the flower kind of imagery in this one, I mean, to me, that's like a really contemporary kind of mm -hmm. thing that, that doesn't, once it's inside your construction, um, the composition here, it, it fits in there. I think that any of these parts you'd be, when you made that decision, it must have seemed, um, you know, is this going to work? And are you making yeah. those decisions in the computer or in the drawing sketchbook? Usually the drawing or, and on the canvas. Yeah, I so mean, a lot of times the painting is in a very rough state and, and, I, and I'll knock something in and then see how it feels. And so, you know, the, I mean, there's, there's definitely decisions that are informed, but there's also things that are really about, you know, the kind of intuition that can only happen when you're you know, when you're when you're following the decision until it feels right, you know, and then you say, okay, that feels right, and then you can decide dissect that intellectually later. So, you know. Do, do you have a, a favorite scale now that you've painted everywhere from two feet to uh, ten feet? Well, ironically enough, the small paintings are no easier to make than the big paintings. <laughs> Which when I first started doing them, I was like, this would be great. I make a lot of small paintings and. Some of those take me two, three months. Some of these take me two, three months. So um, I actually really love working in this scale. I feel this is the perfect scale to work in for me. So um, yeah, the big paintings, are, yeah, they have physical issues. Yes. <laughs> but I, I really, I mean, as you can see, that there's a, a lot of paintings that are in the sort of your of six yeah. by four to five feet range. And um, in, it, it, it's very much about all you can see about all you can see in a scale in a lot of ways and, and, and that feels very comfortable to me interesting so. does anybody else have a um, in the drawings Christy on my lord you're actually working on digital images right and right. not painting them how right. is that I mean can you talk a little yeah. bit about how the paint it seems like the digital holds a different place spatially than right. the medicine. You don't want to force, you know and make a space yeah. which is which yeah. yeah well it, what's interesting is all of these have elements in them that came from a printout that was done on the computer. Mm -hmm. And so as I was doing that over and over and over, my desire was, okay, it would be really great to do some works on paper or some kind of flat work that would directly involve that printed media. Mm -hmm. You know, I could print the digital image directly and something I could work on. You know, I don't know how you do it on Canvas. I think you can, but, you know, I, I mean, it's doable, but it, you know, just never could figure out how to do that really successfully. And so at Holy Cross, for Susan and I work, we got this fantastic um, inkjet large format printer that uses archival ink. And so I was able to get a hold of Mylar. And I wanted to use Mylar because it has that kind of crystalline surface. It has that kind of blurry depth that I was trying to simulate with paintings. Um, and I so it's the ahead. vellum surface of Mylar, not the slick. I guess right. It's, it's it looks like basically it looks like vellum, but it's in a you know it's like a plastic, mm -hmm. and um, and then it's printable. It takes the ink beautifully, um, and and then you know I printed up several of them. A lot. I had a, a big stack of them where I just printed backgrounds and then just started working on the foregrounds. And in fact, actually going back to your question about accidents, these are really much more about random things. Mm -hmm. And it's some 
after doing many of these things over and over and really thinking about the imagery and and you know where these sources come from and, and you know where my ideas spring from, I have a vocabulary in my head that I can trust will just come out of the work. You don't have a particular thing planned. No, no. So a lot of times yes. it would be print a bunch of backgrounds. Um, make some stencils, spray paint or airbrush through those stencils, and then just start painting something in the foreground, whatever. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and so just they're fast, they're they're really direct, they're really responsive. Um, they're actually a nice counterpoint to this because sometimes these are just very just so labor intensive. They're so much about occupying you know my mind and, and decisions and, and these are just really much more about responding to what's there mm -hmm. and it's the really linear quality of the gouache is, you know you can in this one but yeah it's very you know it's a very specific i don't know if it's an asian kind of miniature or what but it's, well it's i've been kind looking of, at a lot of asian work lately actually it's really nice. yeah and yeah. It, it seems like you know at one moment you know anime and cartoon and another mm -hmm. moment is you know an antique scroll or Right, you know, right. Smoke or whatever. Uh, yeah. It's commonly rendered, but it's so different than. I mean, it's almost like the painterly portion is the digital part mm -hmm. in that one, and the part that looks like it's from a computer yeah. is the painted part, and it's this nice flip. Yeah, yeah, that's that a really place. good point. And what was, what's nice about these as well is um, I had worked with some acrylic in the past and works on paper, but I'd never worked with it extensively, you know, and I've always been such a an oil painter. And using acrylic on these was really um, freeing in a lot of ways because it brought this graphic quality to the work that doesn't happen with the oil painting. And what's interesting sometimes when you make a new body of work that is an extension of what you've been doing but new, not only is it positive, but sometimes it also begs some important questions of your previous work. So one of the things it does, and it has come out of this is, okay, now that I've pushed them in this direction, how do I bring some of that information back to the oil painting? So, so in a lot of ways, what we see here is is representative of a body of work that is closed, and what's over here is indicative of what might might come in the future with the work. And so, what I would love to do is to fuse those things together. You know, the ability of oil to be able to create these illusionistic, blended physical surfaces that you can only get in oil, but then be able to get that kind of crisp graphic linear quality that you can only get in acrylic because it's very difficult to get that in oil. So And you don't use oil on paper or you have Oh you could. Yeah, yeah. So so I'm playing with it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean definitely like what's happening here it was a very important shift. Like this was a real big revelation. Like the idea of overlaying something that's flat and linear over something that's almost like a window and combining those two elements. So so these will be the things we'll be tackling in the next body work. <laughs> Excellent. Anybody else? Yeah. Hey. Oh, look, it's me. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm just curious if you are aware of or how you feel about your work having a personal narrative to it. Because when you said that you had a vocabulary, it really stood out to me. And in seeing it before, like everything that you've said has been sort of about the technical side, the art mm -hmm. artistry side, and are about intuitive decisions and your relationship with your intuitive decisions. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if there is or at what point you have this relationship with a painting where it's it's telling you something or you have a personal narrative mm -hmm. within mm -hmm. one or within several. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it was necessarily identified as narrative, but I would definitely identify it as, a, as a history of things that I've always been very fascinated with. And as I said earlier, um, Thinking back on the whole idea of Alice in Wonderland, it's you know I don't talk about that so much in my work anymore. But um, the relationship with that with that story was really important to me from from as long as I can remember. You know this idea of of passing through realities, and so that's always something that's really captured my imagination. That's really captured my psyche. And throughout the history of my work, there's always been this desire to somehow or another conquer that kind of space. You know, like this idea of, of painting these things over and over is a way to to negotiate that space. I also had this um, this intense fear of infinity, <laughs> and so to the point where I would get up in the middle of the night when I was a really young child and wake up my parents, and 
asked them why there was no end to the universe, and it just boggled my mind. And sometimes when I think about it too much, it freaks me out again. <laughs> and so in a lot of ways, you know, I've felt like I've been playing this out in my work, like this idea of, of, of thinking about space as finite rather than infinite. For me, a painting is about finite space that you can control and that you can live within and you can see the borders of, um, yet at the same time you can imply infinity. And so, you know, for me, I feel like I've played this question out over and over again with my work. You know, the painting is really about the idea of finite versus infinity. And that the things that really start to feel like I have a connection with them in terms of, you know, like what I read and what I see, um, all have to do with that kind of exploration, like the idea of infinite variables and infinite space and finite space and, and you know, how as a human being do we live within that or do we see that or do we imagine that? So, and in a way I think adding or using images that come from the familiar world and then making them unfamiliar is, in my mind, the only way that you know, a small human brain can wrap itself around that. It's like creating mythology. You know, like mythology is based on what we have around us that we observe, yet it's also a way to somehow or other explain what we can understand. So that's, you know, what a lot of these become about, in a way. So like the mythology of, of what we can understand, so. Yes. <laughs> well, it's just really interesting that you're saying that, that a lot of these have this um, sort of feeling of looking, this one especially, like looking at cells or things in a microscope. Mm -hmm. So these, there is this other world that we don't normally see that when you're, when it's put under the microscope. So do you, I mean, because you are choosing all these things that are sort of like, you know, these like, you said jellyfish, but these mm -hmm. are like cellular, mm -hmm. like plants, like things from the natural world. Right. But we don't normally get to see those things. There's something that are revealed yeah. through a closer inspection. Mm -hmm. Right, and so there are also it, things that we, like if you think about the color, when we look at these objects, the color that's identified on those objects really comes from, you know, like things that we add to it so that they'll look more attractive to the eye. You know, like when you look at the microscopy, yes, the color that we see there is not the color that really exists, it's the color that we add. There's purples and blues? Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, um, but, you know, again, I, uh, for me, going back to, like, linking what you're saying to what Amy's saying, um, is also the idea that the farther apart you go in scale, that there might be even more similarity. So you go deep as deep as you can into the microscopic or subatomic level, all of a sudden they become resemblances to what's enormous and what's immense on the cosmological level. And for me that's comforting <laughs> because again, like this whole idea that, well, it just never ends out there. It just keeps going. Uh, yeah, and like going. looking at the horizon, you know, you kind if of- If I can bring it full circle. <laughs> Well, it the rules, bit... the rules of that reality. I mean, when you look at something underwater, you realize they're weightless. They can mm. kind of float around. And all of a sudden, you're thinking science fiction. They got little mini paddles. There, you know. And I know, looking at pond water in fifth grade, you know, you're kind of dazzled. It is that world yeah. within a world. And mm -hmm. it, I think you immediately start believing. Well, if this can be happening in a puddle, right? Yeah, you know, that whole, you know, I am the. Adam in the thumbnail of the yeah, giant. Yeah, <laughs> Horton meets a who. Yeah, Horton meets a who. It's much like more dandelion. appropriate. Dandelion. There's a whole world inside there. Of people running around with the city. And, you know, all that's really. I, you know, I, I think for me it also makes me feel like okay, there is some order and, and linkage to all this. You know, regardless of what you believe, and I think we. You need that order, do you? I think I do actually. <laughs> <laughs> if it gets too random and chaotic for me, it just you know I might I just can't. For me, it's you know finding the links between all these things, you know, brings me some some comfort psychologically. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, that probably explains why they're so tied together so convincingly. I yeah, think in all of this work. Okay. Well, uh, well thank, thank you guys you. all for coming.